So looking at um, genetic syndromes, what is the role of the physical therapist? Well, when we um, are working with children and families, we really want to assess whether we think that genetic syndromes may be a factor. Um, family history, taking a good family history may reveal an inherited disorder. We want to look for clinical dysmorphisms, so we'll get to that in a, in a moment um, in more detail, but clinical dysmorphisms really uh, refer to the different kind of physical um, and biological characteristics that we see commonly in individuals with genetic syndromes. Uh, we want to look for uh, evidence of anatomical or physiological abnormalities. So if we there are brain abnormalities um, that were captured on imaging, those might be things to consider. We also want to look at our neuromotor assessment. So weakness, um, tone, motor control, and discoordination are all often seen in children with genetic disorders. We may also see global developmental delay, learning and behavior problems, language delays, and sometimes we'll see autistic-like behaviors and qualities. Published guidelines suggest that any child with global developmental delay be referred for genetic testing. So as a, as a physical therapist, it's important for us to kind of look at the whole package, and um, particularly for children with global developmental delays, we, we may want to refer those children and families for genetic testing to rule out any genetic syndromes. Table E2-1 um, in your uh, book actually gives a nice summary of indications for genetic services. And uh, box E2-2 has a whole uh, list of clinical dysmorphisms. So when talking about clinical dysmorphisms, we are talking about sort of the physical characteristics um, of people with genetic disabilities, or disorders, excuse me. And we, this is a picture here of two individuals with Down syndrome. And you can probably look right away and start to think about what sort of physical features that you see here that looks different than somebody with a normal or typical genetic profile. Um, often we see that people with Down syndrome have smaller mouths. They may have shorter stature and shorter limbs. Um, we see that wide, the wide set eyes and the flat bridge of the nose you can see here. Um, the epicanthal folds. Oftentimes there are low set ears. So all of those things you can sort of see in these pictures. And there are um, a number of clinical dysmorphisms that are commonly seen in individuals with genetic disorders, not just in Down syndrome, but all genetic disorders. Um, and again, we want to really be on the lookout for these things because they really can point us towards a genetic disorder as a cause of a disability. We can see structural, structural brain abnormalities, such as microcephaly, actual cranial anomalies, um, such as a flat or even very prominent occiput, we often see an abnormal pattern of scalp or facial hair, and uh, there's something called the posterior parietal hair whirl that sometimes is seen. Um, a widow's peak is often seen in, in individuals with genetic disorders. We see sort of abnormal facial features, so sort of that flatness of the face is, is a clinical dysmorphism. Eye or orbit abnormalities, such as the epicanthal folds that we'll see in individuals with Down syndrome. Nasal abnormalities, commonly we see a low or flat nasal bridge. Maxillary and mandibular abnormalities, um, we sometimes will see cleft palate or a very high arched palate. In the mouth and oral region, we often see things like a small mouth or a small or um, relatively large tongue. The external ears are often low set. The neck can be somewhat short or um, have like a webbed appearance. Skeletal abnormalities are common. We often see things like scoliosis. Limb and joint abnormalities, um, short digits, short limbs are all common. There may be issues with hematology or oncology. Um, we often see anemia. And then growth abnormalities, um, we will often see obesity in these populations. So kind of backing up to do a quick genetics review, um, just as a kind of a reminder and a review for you, we have 23 pairs of chromosome, 22 pairs are autosomes, and one pair are sex chromosomes, so that's your XY. 
Chromosomes are composed of DNA, and a gene is a length of DNA that codes for a specific protein. And there are approximately 30,000 human genes. So we're primarily today going to talk about chromosomal abnormalities, but there are um, almost infinite numbers of um, abnormalities and, and variations that can occur in um, genes and DNA. And so it's important to remember, even though we're going to focus on chromosomal abnormalities, there are a number of disorders out there um, that, are, that are even smaller related to, to genes. So talking about genetic disorders, um, we use the term mutations. So the mutation is an alteration in the DNA sequence, and that may cause a genetic disorder. So mutations may um, occur as a single point mutation. That's when one base pair is substituted or replaced by another, and that's the case in most cases of cystic fibrosis. A gain of function can, it refers to gene overexpression, where a loss of function refers to reduced gene expression. Um, we can have somatic mosaicis, mosaicism. That's when a mutation occurs after conception and only some of the body cells are affected. So the phenotypic expression of the disorder is going to, going to be milder in a mosaicism um, because the, not all of the cells of the body are affected. And then there's also a germline mosaicism, which is when the germline contains the mutation, but somatic cells do not. So that means that the individual doesn't express the disease or the disorder, but can then transmit the mutation to offspring. Um, chromosomal disorders occur in one of every 160 live births. They are the leading cause of pregnancy loss. Uh, chromosomal disorders account for at least 50% of all first trimester miscarriages and 20% of second trimester miscarriages. And we can see um, different chromosomal disorders can be deletions, duplications, or translocations. And one of the most common uh, chromosomal disorders that we know is Down syndrome, also referred to as trisomy 21. And here in this figure on the right, we have an infant who has Down syndrome. And on the left, we have a karyotyping um, image where you can actually see the, all of the different pairs, the 23 pair of chromosomes, but if you look down there at the bottom at number 21, you can see we have three chromosomes there for 21. And so that's that third 21st chromosome is what causes Down syndrome. Um, 90 to 95% of the extra chromosome, um, in the 90 to 95% of cases of Down syndrome, that extra chromosome can be attributed to the mother, and advanced maternal age is considered to be a significant factor. The mean maternal age for mothers of children with Down syndrome is 32 years old. So while that's certainly not old, and um, there's certainly a much higher likelihood of having a healthy baby in, in your 30s than not, um, there is an increased risk of Down syndrome as, in older mothers. Some impairments that are commonly seen in Down syndrome, um, diastasis recti is common, joint hypermobility, so we see very lax, very loose joints, and these kids can really perform movements that almost, um, you know, look, sometimes look really unnatural because they're so flexible. Atlantoaxial instability is seen in about 12% of children with Down syndrome, and this is really important for us to, to know. Um, we have to make sure that um, x-rays, usually x-rays are done by about age two to determine whether a child with Down syndrome has atlantoaxial instability. Um, if they don't, then they're able to participate in all activities without restriction. If they do have atlantoaxial instability, we have to really be careful about things like doing somersaults, um, you know, anything where they're kind of on their head that's going to risk the subluxation of that joint and um, risk significant injury. And really before the child has an x-ray to determine whether they have atlantoaxial instability, we really should just assume that they do and try to avoid um, any of those types of activities. Mild microcephaly is often seen in Down syndrome. Intellectual disability is part of Down syndrome, and this can be a, a real range. Um, 
almost all individuals with Down syndrome do have some sort of intellectual disability, but they could be, um, it can be a very significant intellectual disability or fairly mild. Hypotonia is typically seen in children with Down syndrome, as well as just a general developmental delay. And this is a table um, from uh, a book by Winders, uh, published in 1997, where she actually um, took a number of children with Down syndrome and kind of came up with these average ages of attainment for different skills in kids with Down syndrome. So you can see rolling from stomach to back occurred at six months, rolling from back to stomach occurred at seven months, sitting alone occurred at 11 months, creeps and quadruped occurred at 14 months, standing alone occurred at about 21 months, walking 15 feet alone occurred at 26 months, Walking upstairs was at 39 months, and walking downstairs occurred at 40 months, and jumping occurred at 47 months. So oftentimes, um, the way I sort of remember it and think about it is, especially early on, that it, you know, children with Down syndrome are going to tend to take about twice as long as children without Down syndrome to achieve different motor skills. So sitting alone occurs at about 11 months in a child with Down syndrome, whereas we know it occurs at about six months in children who are typically developing. Um, similarly, standing and walking usually occurs between 10 to 12 months in children without Down syndrome, and we see here it's 21 to 26 months in children without. So overall, we see that children with Down syndrome really tend to meet all their milestones. They just do it a bit more slowly, and uh, generally it kind of happens twice as slow. Another common um, genetic disorder is another trisomy. It's called trisomy 18, known as Edwards syndrome. And here you see a picture of an um, infant with Edwards syndrome. As you can see from the, um, just from visualizing this baby, that Edwards syndrome is characterized by really high tone, um, fisted hand, and a specific fist fisted posture um, where the second and third fingers tend to cross. And you can really see that in this baby here. Edwards syndrome occurs in one out of every 6,000 births. Over 90% of um, Edwards syndrome actually results in miscarriages or stillbirths. So the vast majority of babies um, with Edwards syndrome um, do not make it to term alive. There are over 100 associated malformations with Edwards syndrome. And 90% um, of children born alive with trisomy 18 die within one year. The median age of survival is two weeks. So this is not a condition that, is, um, that often results in, in living very long. And in children with Edwards, Edwards syndrome, a lot of times we initially see um, a real hypotonic posture, but hypertonicity quickly develops. And clearly, with, in children with Edwards syndrome, because the life expectancy isn't as long, um, we certainly want to promote um, good sensory motor experiences and uh, nice parent and child interactions. Um, but we also um, are just going to kind of try to keep that baby as happy and comfortable as possible. There are a couple of chromosomal deletions that are discussed in your book. Um, Creta Shaw syndrome and 18P syndrome are commonly seen, and um, you can get more information about those syndromes in your textbook. And then there are chromosomal micro deletions that are commonly seen. Um, those include prater willi syndrome, Angelman syndrome, and Williams syndrome. Again, there's more details on all of those in your textbook. And then there are a number of sex-linked disorders that are commonly seen. Um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, hemophilia A, Lesch-Nien syndrome, fragile X syndrome, and Rett syndrome are all sex-linked disorders that can be either recessive or, or dominant. And again, all of those are described in more detail in your textbook.